So this week we're going to talk about the Tudors, the legacy of medieval law, and finally the Stuarts. And we're looking here at a very important history for a couple of reasons. The first is that obviously English law has a huge impact on American law because Americans borrowed so much from uh, the English legal traditions, especially given that, that uh, England largely controlled the colonial, uh, the, settlement, the colonial settlement of North America. So it's important for that reason. It's also important for a second reason, and we'll talk about this more when we get to class, but that is because this history, the history of the Tudors and the Stuarts, formed a kind of narrative that was very important to the founders. Uh, in the same way that we tend to look to the founders for guidance, uh, to think about uh, the founders as having a specific kind of authority, the founders did the same thing with uh, figures in Tudor Stuart England. And they told these stories to each other, they read about these, they, ga they gathered a lot of wisdom from the actual history uh, of the 16th and 17th centuries. So we want to look really at three issues. The first is to look at what exactly is a king. And what we'll find here is that medieval notions of a king uh, were greatly different from early modern notions of a king. So you want to start thinking about how kingship transforms in the 16th century. Uh, the second question is how the legacy of medieval law restrained kings. As kings move towards more power, particularly towards absolute power, which they do in, in virtually every monarchy in Europe, including England, in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, medieval law did serve to restrain them. So we have to think about precisely how that happened. Finally, we have to, to think about the specific changes that were made in England. How did the Tudors transform medieval government? And uh, we're going to come back to this last question actually in a second lecture. For this one, we're just going to look briefly at the legacy uh, of medieval law. But I do want you to think about this in long-term chronolog chronological perspective. And it, you'll notice here, if you look carefully at uh, the 15th through the 18th century, uh, what you see is a stable Tudor dynasty, and they really followed civil war, and then they bequeathed civil war. They were an island uh, on the side of two tempests, if you will. And so for that reason alone, uh, this Tudor history becomes very important. Now, in thinking about the medieval legacies of the common law, I want to think about uh, several things. And really, here I want to talk about the common law as an abstract set of principles, as a concrete set of institutions, and as a set of formal law that by the 16th century had become strong enough and powerful enough that certainly no king could be expected to understand its intricacies. And there are within its formalism and procedure several things that are very important. The first is the development of an appellate system within the courts, and I have this referred to here as judicial review. And I don't mean the American practice of courts reviewing legislation for its constitutionality. That's not the judicial review that I'm speaking of here. The judicial review I'm speaking of is the review of an inf uh, by a superior court of a, the record of an inferior court. The primary way it did this, uh, the way this worked in the medieval era, was through the writ of error. And it's important to mention this for two reasons. First, the writ of error survives into American constitutional practice. It was the primary means by which the, state, the Supreme Court of the United States reviewed cases. And in fact, it was through the writ of error that they reviewed cases right up until the 1920s, I believe. Uh, the second reason is uh, that the writ of error and the way it works uh, treats the record, this is a law that grows up around the writ, it treats the record that gets called up as sacrosanct. That is to say, all facts that were in the record when it arrived were uh, simply assumed to be true. The only thing that could be checked and corrected were errors on the face of the legal record. So if the judge at the lower court applied the wrong law or did not follow the correct procedure at some point, that could be corrected. And when that was corrected, it usually meant throwing the case back down to be retried. So procedure actually becomes very important uh, around the writ of error. And the same thing is largely true of the appeal. Uh, it was another means of, of getting cases to uh, uh, superior courts. Now, uh, I talked about institutional stability, and I wanted to put this diagram up so you'll get an idea of two things. First of all, royal justice is quite advanced by the 16th century. You have uh, the law side, um, the common law uh, courts, which are established at Westminster, King's Bench, Common Pleas, 
uh, the exchequer, I'm actually missing one here, the exchequer was a, its own court, exchequer chamber was uh, all of the, the common law justices uh, sitting in bank, which meant all sitting together. So there's actually four courts, there's three formal ones. Uh, King's Bench, Common Pleas, and Exchequer. And then the Exchequer Chamber kind of reviews serious legal issues when they want more justices' opinions. The Assize Courts, uh, these are the, the itinerant royal justices who go out and hear criminal cases in the counties. Um, they uh, also meet in Westminster and Bonk. And in fact, uh, through the appeal, they, they would oftentimes reserve uh, difficult points of law for discussion with all of the judges when they got back to Westminster. And this is one of the ways that the appeal develops. Um, finally, uh, there was the law side and there was the equity side, and uh, I, we discussed equity last week, so hopefully you understand it, but the important thing is that uh, uh, the chancellor actually, the chancellor himself was sort of the, the reserve power of equity, he was the one who sat over uh, the chancery and heard equity cases. So equity is a limited jurisdiction, but it still represents another important point of royal justice. But notice that the bulk of law, uh, fully 80% of the law is administered at the local level by justices that are not really royal justices, uh, by the city courts, by the manorial courts, by justices of the peace in the county. So this, this represents the majority of, of uh, what we see. Uh, the prerogative courts, at least at the beginning of the 16th century, were also quite small. They will become more important, uh, as we shall see, with the Tudors. But now, in terms of the formalism of the common law, we have to keep in mind here that the ossified writ system, that is, the writ system that developed from the 12th through the 14th centuries, had become completely established. And as such, kings could not actually uh, modify the writs. And uh, in fact, this, this creates a rather interesting situation. Uh, kings, when they come into power, I mean, if you go back to the, the 12th century, uh, you think about kings like Henry II, he's, he was actually out creating writs and creating a system of justice. But by the time we get to the 15th century, kings are born into this system, and they can no longer change it. And they must receive it because it is, in fact, the word of the king that establishes it. And by the way, I, this is confusing. Obviously, this is the uh, number of writs which have been issued. There becomes a system to this in, in, in a way. Uh, these were, were writs that dealt with property. Uh, these were writs that, in fact, dealt with uh, what we would call kind of early modern or medieval contract. These writs, which developed in the 14th century, dealt with what the more common ideas of contract and tort law. Uh, but it's almost impossible for any king to really understand it. And that's important to understand as a means by which the king was, in fact, limited by the king. Uh, and this, of course, is, is a weird sort of idea. But it gets back to this, this old maxim, uh, which the English were quite fond of. Uh, Quad rex non debit esse sub homine sed sub deo et lege, uh, which is to say that uh, the king is not, while the king is not under any man, he should be uh, beneath God and the law. So the king cannot be below any other man. Uh, he is at the top, but at the same time, he is restrained by the law. Now, this is weird. He's the source of law on the one hand. The king is recognized as the fountain of justice. And in fact, his position as being the fountain of justice or the progenitor of law means that no law can run against him. Uh, he can't be the target of a special prosecutor the way the president can in the United States. Uh, and in fact, this is the genesis of another legal maxim, which the English were quite fond of. The king can do no wrong. And they don't mean here that the king can't be wrong. Of course, the king can be wrong. Anybody can be wrong. They mean wrong in the legal sense. A wrong like an assault and battery is a wrong, or breach of contract is a wrong. The king can do no wrong because no writ will run against the king. If no writ will run against the king, then the king can do no wrong. It's a kind of interesting little logical uh, twist there, but it is entirely true. We know this today, by the way, as the sovereign exception, and uh, it certainly survives into uh, um, it certainly survives into, into modern law with this. Now, uh, it's worth mentioning here that in the medieval tradition, there were in fact ways in which the uh, all-powerful king was in fact underneath the law and God. And one way was by distinguishing between the natural law and positive law. And this is a distinction that we'll see brought up in multiple contexts throughout the class. 
Uh, certainly in the 18th and 19th centuries, they struggle with the idea of a natural law versus a positive law. Now, briefly here, positive law refers to actual pronouncements. These are pronouncements by the king or by parliament or by a court or by a, a itinerant judge. Positive law is law that is written down. It is a actual positive pronouncement. Um, in the medieval era, natural law referred to specific rights held by the people or held by clergy, uh, held by other people with special kinds of exemptions, uh, magnates, for instance. Uh, and for the king to, to violate these rights was considered to be a violation of natural law. And it was quite frequent that judges uh, would then not follow such things. And kings were quite careful to make sure they didn't tread into these areas. And in fact, this creates, it's, it's difficult for us to understand this because modern logic would require somebody to be absolute or not. Uh, but in fact, in medieval law, this just was not the case. And they make some distinctions that might help us out logically. For instance, saying that the king was supreme in, in his own personal area, the gubernaculum. This is the area of his governance. Whereas, jurisdictio, which is uh, the more traditional understanding of uh, uh, the law's uh, jurisdiction, uh, there the king could speak, but there were multiple things that impinged on his power. So there were some areas where he had absolute power and other areas, obviously, where he didn't. So here we have the, you know, some of the most important medieval legacies uh, which the Tudors would have to contend with. And it's worth perhaps maybe moving now to a, a couple of specific examples uh, in, in which we can see how the law restrained the king. Uh, and ways in which uh, ambitious kings were uh, checked by, by the machinery of the law. And I'll give you two examples, and they're historically relevant for a couple of reasons that actually connect to the United, to United States history. So it's really worth mentioning. Um, if we go back to 1363, uh, Parliament met in this year, and they considered several petitions by subjects. That, who complained that they had been detained e illegally by order of the king's council. So Parliament issued an order in the form of a statute. And it's worth here uh, perhaps quoting it at length, or, or maybe paraphrasing it at least. Basically what the statute said was, uh, people have been making bad suggestions to the king, and the king is, is uh, uh, through his, his order in council, which means usually by proclamation, that's the, the way it's issued, uh, by proclamation, he's ordering that people be held over. They're being questioned by the council. And uh, this is against the established forms of the law. And uh, it's not a proper way for somebody to make an accusation. So the statute said, if you want to make an accusation, go before the courts of law and make your accusation. In 1368, in 1368, Parliament met, considered more petitions, and issued a similar statute. Now, this one is worth maybe taking a look at. At the request of the commons by their petitions and put forth in this parliament to eschew the mischiefs and damages done to diverse of his commons by false accusees, which oftentimes have made their accusations more for revenge and singular benefit than for the profit of the king or of his people, which accused persons, some have been taken, and others caused to come before the king's council by writ, and otherwise upon grievous pain against the law, it is assented and accorded for the good of government of the commons that no man be put to answer without presentment before justices or matter of record or by due process and writ original according to the old law of the land. And if anything from henceforth be done to the contrary, it shall be void in the law and holden for error. So here we have, I mean, if we break this down really quickly, you see some very important things happening here. First of all, uh, this preamble in the statute explains that the king is not to blame, uh, but rather people are deceiving the king and using the king's counsel as a means of uh, detaining their enemies. And then very importantly, uh, that this is against the law. That is, the uh, king's counsel acting this way is against the law. And here, of course, they're referring to the established common law. And then here is the command. It is assented and accorded for the good government of the commons that no man be put to answer without presentment before justices. So you cannot force somebody to answer unless a grand jury 
or uh, has has indicted, or a uh, the justices have have then issued a presentment. So they're requiring this procedure, or matter of record. So matter of legal record has to be taken, or by due process. And this, by the way, 1368 is the first time we see the words due process in the uh, English legal tradition. These are words that will have a momentous impact by the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. And here it is first appearing in 1368. So here we have uh, a, oh, and then very importantly, uh, if, if uh, anything from henceforth be done to the contrary, it shall be void in the law and holden for error, which means, of course, you now have uh, the availability of a writ of error. So if you are detained illegally, uh, a judge can now order your release by, by, by issuing a writ of error. So here is uh, an example of how the king's order, which was what the king was doing when he, his council uh, issued these proclamations detaining people, could be declared to be against the law.